It is now almost two months since the people of this country began to put up with restrictions on their freedom, your freedom, of a kind that we have never seen before in peace or war. And you have shown the good sense to support those rules overwhelmingly. You've put up with all the hardships of that programme of social distancing because you understand that as things stand, and as the experience of every other country has shown, it's the only way to defeat the coronavirus, the most vicious threat this country has faced in my lifetime. And though the death toll has been tragic and the suffering immense, and though we grieve for all those we have lost, it is a fact that by adopting those measures, we prevented this country from being engulfed by what could have been a catastrophe in which the reasonable worst case scenario was half a million fatalities. And it's thanks to your effort and sacrifice in stopping the spread of this disease that the death rate is coming down and hospital admissions are coming down. And thanks to you, we've protected our NHS and saved many thousands of lives. And so I know, you know, that it would be madness now to throw away that achievement by allowing a second spike. We must stay alert. We must continue to control the virus and save lives. And yet we must also recognise that this campaign against the virus has come at colossal cost to our way of life. We can see it all around us in the shuttered shops and abandoned businesses and darkened pubs and restaurants. And there are millions of people who are both fearful of this terrible disease and at the same time also fearful of what this long period of enforced inactivity will do to their livelihoods and their mental and physical well-being, to their futures and the futures of their children. So I want to provide tonight for you the shape of a plan to address both fears, both to beat the virus and provide the first sketch of a roadmap for reopening society, a sense of the way ahead and when and how and on what basis we will take the decisions to proceed. I'll be sending out more details in Parliament tomorrow and taking questions from the public in the evening. I've consulted across the political spectrum, across all four nations of the UK. And though different parts of the country are experiencing the pandemic at different rates, and though it's right to be flexible in our response, I believe that as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Scotland, England, Wales, Northern Ireland, there is a strong resolve to defeat this together. And today, a general consensus on what we could do. And I stress could, because although we have a plan, it is a conditional plan. And since our priority is to protect the public and save lives, we cannot move forward unless we satisfy the five tests. We must protect our NHS. We must see sustained falls in the death rate. We must see sustained and considerable falls in the rate of infection. We must sort out our challenges in getting enough PPE to the people who need it. And yes, it's a global problem, but we must fix it. And last, we must make sure that any measures we take do not force the reproduction rate of the disease the R back up over one, so that we have the kind of exponential growth we were facing a few weeks ago. And to chart our progress and to avoid going back to square one, we're establishing a new COVID alert system run by a new joint biosecurity centre. And that COVID alert level will be determined primarily by R and the number of coronavirus cases and in turn, that COVID alert level will tell us how tough we have to be in our social distancing measures. The lower the level, the fewer the measures, the higher the level, the tougher and stricter we will have to be. There will be five alert levels. Level one means the disease is no longer present in the UK 
And level five is the most critical, the kind of situation we could have had if the NHS had been overwhelmed. Over the period of the lockdown, we've been in level four, and it's thanks to your sacrifice, we're now in a position to begin to move in steps to level three. And as we go, everyone will have a role to play in keeping the R down by staying alert and following the rules. And to keep pushing the number of infections down, there are two more things we must do. We must reverse rapidly the awful epidemics in care homes and in the NHS. And though the numbers are coming down sharply now, there is plainly much more to be done. And if we're to control this virus, then we must have a world-beating system for testing potential victims and for tracing their contacts. So that, all told, we are testing literally hundreds of thousands of people every day. We've made fast progress on testing, but there is so much more to do now, and we can. When this began, we hadn't seen this disease before, and we didn't fully understand its effects. With every day, we're getting more and more data. We're shining the light of science on this invisible killer, and we will pick it up where it strikes, because our new system will be able in time to detect local flare-ups in your area, as well as giving us a national picture. And yet, when I look at where we are tonight, we have the R below one, between 0.5 and 0.9, but potentially only just below one. And though we have made progress in satisfying at least some of the conditions I have given, we have by no means fulfilled all of them. And so, no, this is not the time simply to end the lockdown this week. Instead, we're taking the first careful steps to modify our measures. And the first step is a change of emphasis that we hope that people will act on this week. We said that you should work from home if you can and only go to work if you must. We now need to stress that anyone who can't work from home, for instance, those in construction or manufacturing, should be actively encouraged to go to work and we want it to be safe for you to get to work. So you should Avoid public transport, if at all possible, because we must and will maintain social distancing and capacity will therefore be limited. So, work from home if you can, but you should go to work if you can't work from home. And to ensure you are safe at work, we've been working to establish new guidance for employers to make workplaces COVID secure. And when you do go to work, if possible, do so by car, or even better, by walking or bicycle. But just as with workplaces, public transport operators will also be following COVID secure standards. And from this Wednesday, we want to encourage people to take more and even unlimited amounts of outdoor exercise. You can sit in the sun in your local park, you can drive to other destinations, you can even play sports only with members of your own household. You must obey the rules on social distancing. And to enforce those rules, we will increase the fines for the small minority who break them. And so every day, with ever increasing data, we will be monitoring the R and the number of new infections and the progress we are making. And if we as a nation begin to fulfill the conditions I have set out, then in the next few weeks, and months, we may be able to go further. In step two, at the earliest by June the 1st, after half term, we believe we may be in a position to begin the phased reopening of shops and to get primary pupils back into schools in stages beginning with reception, year one and year six. Our ambition is that secondary pupils facing exams next year will get at least some time with their teachers before the holidays. And we'll shortly be setting out detailed guidance on how to make it work in schools and shops and on transport. 
And step three, at the earliest by July and subject to all these conditions and further scientific advice, if and only if the numbers support it, we will hope to reopen at least some of the hospitality industry and other public places, provided they're safe and enforce social distancing. Throughout this period of the next two months, we will be driven not by mere hope or economic necessity. We're going to be driven by the science, the data and public health. And I must stress again that all of this is conditional. It all depends on a series of big ifs. It depends on all of us, the entire country, to follow the advice, to observe social distancing and to keep that R down. And to prevent reinfection from abroad, I'm serving notice that it will soon be the time, with transmission significantly lower, to impose quarantine on people coming into this country by air. And it's because of your efforts to get the R down and the number of infections down here that this measure will now be effective. And of course, we will be monitoring our progress locally, regionally, and nationally. And if there are outbreaks, if there are problems, we will not hesitate to put on the brakes. We've been through the initial peak, but it's coming down the mountain that is often more dangerous. We have a route and we have a plan. And everyone in government has the all-consuming pressure and challenge to save lives, restore livelihoods, and gradually restore the freedoms that we need. But in the end, this is a plan that everyone must make work. And when I look at what you've done already, the patience and common sense you've shown, the fortitude of the elderly, whose isolation we all want to end as fast as we can, the incredible bravery and hard work of our NHS staff, our care workers, the devotion and self-sacrifice of all those in every walk of life who are helping us to beat this disease, police, bus drivers, train drivers, pharmacists, supermarket workers, road hauliers, bin collectors, cleaners, security guards, postal workers, our teachers, and a thousand more, the scientists who are working round the clock to find a vaccine. When I think of the millions of everyday acts of kindness and thoughtfulness that are being performed across this country, and that have helped to get us through this first phase. I know that we can use this plan to get us through the next. And if we can't do it by those dates, and if the alert level won't allow it, we will simply wait and go on until we've got it right. We will come back from this devilish illness. We will come back to health and robust health. And though the UK will be changed By this experience, I believe we can be stronger and better than ever before, more resilient, more innovative, more economically dynamic, but also more generous and more sharing. But for now, we must stay alert, control the virus and save lives. Thank you very much. Well, there was the Prime Minister, a pre-recorded broadcast. I'll be joined shortly by our political editor, Gary Gibbon, and here in the studio by our health and social care editor, Victoria MacDonald. Victoria, your analysis of what the Prime Minister said. Well, there was, we've got this new slogan, you can see it there, stay alert, control the virus, save lives. And some of the people I've spoken to have said there has been mixed reactions. Stay alert, exactly what do you stay alert for? But in there were some interesting points. He was making, he was very clear that if that R number, if that transmission rate goes up again above one, then they will have to go back to the higher level. Uh, So they have set up this new COVID alert system that's going to be run by a new joint security security centre and they will be looking for the R rate, looking for any movement and looking for an increase in the number of cases. He also acknowledged, and this did need to be acknowledged, uh, that the, uh, the epidemic is still there in care homes and they are very worried about that. The protect the NHS, which we had before, now this is an important point because 
What they found was that that message was so strong that too many people were staying away from the NHS. So we're going to see, we saw too many people with suspected heart attacks, 50% for going into A&E. They're worried about cancer patients not having go, gone in. So I suspect part of this is to actually say to people, Yes, we need you to be aware, to stay alert of COVID-19, but we also need you to use the NHS, that there are beds there, there is the staff. Victoria, thanks very much. Well, let's turn now to Downing Street and our political editor, Gary Gibbon. Gary, what did you make of what the Prime Minister said? Well, it, well, it was interesting, wasn't it? In parallel with what uh, Victoria was saying there about the indirect uh, effects of this uh, shutdown, the Prime Minister was trying to nudge some workers out the door of their homes and back to the workplace. It's been estimated by some people that there are something like 30% uh, of people out there at the moment not working who the government thought would be working now, even when they did shut down. And he was trying to nudge them out and, and, and offer some reassurance about how the workplace uh, would be made safe and so would uh, travel and transport. And I think we'll be hearing more detail on that in the statement of the House of Commons tomorrow. But of course, the thing that everybody will be looking at is the uh, loosening of the restrictions, mainly really focused uh, the, the immediate loosening of restrictions starting on Wednesday uh, on uh, your ability to enjoy the fresh air, sit down, uh, whatever, on a beach uh, in a park, maybe drive to a beach or a park. And what's I think going to be really uh, uh, memorable in the overnight reaction is going to be the reaction from uh, Wales and Scotland on this. The Scottish Government and the Welsh Government uh, don't feel that they're uh, ready for some of these uh, restrictions to be loosened. I think they'll be upset that uh, the Prime Minister wasn't making it absolutely clear in that statement that he was talking about England and they're not ready to uh, uh, go along with everything that he's saying. I imagine the Government will try and uh, uh, spell that out a bit more tomorrow, but I think there will be real anger about that because the reinfection number that uh, uh, Victoria was talking about there, of course we know is high in care homes. All the indications are is, uh, that it is higher in Scotland and Wales than it is in the general population of England at the moment. I think there'll be real concern about that. In terms of what uh, activities are going to be loosened uh, here, because uh, the Prime Minister wasn't absolutely specific there, I get the impression that he's going to be uh, talking a bit more tomorrow about how uh, maybe you can play uh, golf or tennis or go angling with someone who you already uh, live with. You can go to a, a park and sit, at, uh, if you're doing social distancing, with someone from another household. And this goes back to the point about how uh, the, uh, the scientists advising the government think that this COVID-19 does not uh, is not as infectious in the open air as was once right. feared, and they think they might be able to get away with some loosening of restrictions in those areas. And just very briefly, very unusual broadcast filmed by Number 10 themselves. Just take us through that. Well, it, 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 it's part of a, a piece with uh, Number 10 because they uh, have not only wanted to do things this way, but they've also wanted to uh, try and sometimes uh, open up direct questioning uh, with people and not just with the media. And they're going to do a bit more of that uh, tomorrow as well, I'm told. Gary, thanks very much.